What's up guys, it's Michael Morgan here from Lathrop High School and morganapteaching.com. I've got here another AP review video for you, but if you want to join over 90% of my students in passing the AP test, then check out the links below. I've got writing guides, review guides, instruction guides, and everything I know on how to help you pass the AP test. So feel free to check out my website, and if you find this video helpful, don't forget to like and subscribe. Alright, so period 8 is 1945 to 1980. Okay. So, the basic understanding here is you have after World War I, sorry, World War II, you have a big sort of authoritarian right-wing conservative uh, chunk of time, I guess you'd say, or era, uh, followed by a re reactionary, uh, more libertarian left movement in the 1950s, and especially 60s and 70s. Um, so, we'll talk about the start of the Cold War and sort of the authoritarian right wing clamping down in the United States, cultural changes, and then of course some new ideas and challenges by the libertarian uh, left. Again, authoritarian means like we want to control you, what you do and say, etc. Libertarian means you know allow people free speech and freedom of choice and things like that. So that's why we have the civil rights movement, second wave feminism, LBG, LBGTQ movement, all that stuff, environmentalism even. So first, Cold War, let's start with that. Um, it started off pretty poorly because there's a distrust between Stalin and the West, especially how it took us so long to open up a Western front in Europe. He genuinely thought that we wanted the Soviet Union to crumble. So he doesn't really trust us. So even though they agreed at the Yalta conference to sort of, you know, allow governments to self-determine, neither side's gonna exactly do that correctly. We, we pretty much do it by just encouraging them to go the democratic slash capitalist way. Uh, but the, the uh, communist side just straight supports uh, communists in the East. So what we have pretty quickly here is a Western, and this means democratic governments with a more capitalist free market economy uh, block and an Eastern block. And this is just communist, authoritarian communist. Uh, the split's basically Germany. So Germany over, or at least the eastern part of Germany over, uh, as, long, as well as Czechoslovakia, Hungary, uh, Yugoslavia, and all the eastern uh, states are going to be basically forced to be communists, meaning they, the Soviets are going to militaristically and financially support communist parties there and allow them to come into power and uh, support them there. Whereas in the West, we're going to use more incentive-based um, I guess, proposals to get people to go uh, democratic capitalist. So here's how we do it in the West. In the West, we offer to any country, by the way, that's willing to take it, uh, aid through uh, a program named after the guy who came up with it, uh, the Marshall Plan, which was essentially, hey, we, the United States, will give you billions in loans and some grants as long as you agree to have a free market economy uh, and also that you use uh, certain American goods. So this is not forced, but it definitely is an incentivizer. Uh, and that's going to greatly help rebuild Western Europe. And one of the big problems in Western Europe is the threat of socialism or communism in, the, in Western Europe, the uh, areas in which the British and Americans occupy. Because they're doing so poorly, because we have pop population devastation, devastation of infrastructure, economic devastation, etc., people aren't doing very well. So the idea of socialism and communism sounds good uh, to them. And again, we don't really know at this point all the stuff that's going on in um, Stalin's Soviet Union. We don't know about the gulags as much or the de-gulagization is not really well known. All that sort of uh, stuff would, would make us, you know, t turn away from communism. We don't know that yet. So the, what the Marshall Plan does is provide billions to rebuild Europe, and that's going to restart their economies. And that call for socialism and communism uh, in Western Europe and Northern Europe is really going to uh, quell because they have opportunity, growth, and that's going to cause people not to really desire these, um, I guess you would say, communist policies. So Marshall Plan is going to provide aid to allow economic growth and stability. But remember, they have to be free market and uh, use some American industrial goods. That's the, uh, that's the agreement. 
There's going to be a similar program in the East, which is going to be abbreviated as COMECON, which is basically the Soviet Union's version of the Marshall Plan, uh, providing aid uh, for those that accept basically communist systems. Uh, but don't, don't confuse this. The Soviets will use their military and finances to back communist parties in areas like Poland, Hungary, uh, Czechoslovakia, etc. And any, any counter movements to that are going to be uh, persecuted and crushed, and they do. Like in Hungary, they, have a, uh, they attempt a revolt to remove the communists, and the Soviets roll in and uh, enforce the communist regime there. Uh, Czechoslovakia in uh, 1968 also attempts a revolution, but has theirs militaristically reimposed, the, the communist regime. So make no mistake, uh, the West Eastern Bloc is enforced militaristically and financially by the Soviets. All right, so same thing, but for the Eastern countries. Uh, and that's going to help the West largely avoid communism, uh, pretty much entirely. The only state that's actually going to itself become communist is uh, Yugoslavia. The others are going to be compelled by the Soviet Union and military. Okay, um, speaking of military, there is some concern that the Soviets may send their military into Western and Northern Europe uh, to prop up any communist movements or regimes there. So these Western democracies fearing Soviet military intervention, which they're going to see later, at least in the East, they form what's called the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, which is a defensive alliance of democratic uh, states in the North Atlantic, including Canada and the United States. And this is going to be, again, a defensive alliance against, uh, well, anything, but primarily at the time of the Cold War, it's going to be communism. And that's in, I think, 1948. I might have the year, I might be off a year on that, but I think it's 1948. And then the uh, Soviets are going to do the same thing with the Eastern Bloc, is they are going to, whether they believe it or not, uh, they're going to propose the same deal that they believe Western democracies would be the aggressors. So they form a defensive alliance in the form of the Warsaw Pact. And this is kind of a repeat of the alliance systems in World War I in that if you involve one country, you sort of involve all countries. So this becomes uh, scary. Um, tensions really picked up, though, when there was disagreement or distrust or miscommunication on how to handle... Uh, Germany. Now, if you remember the Potsdam Conference, it decided to split into four zones occupied by France, Britain, the United States, and the Soviet Union. And the uh, British, French, and United States are going to merge their zones pretty quickly. Uh, of course, promoting democratic capitalism. And the Soviets are going to take that as a threat against self-determination in Eastern Germany. Like, they want a communist regime there. So what they do is they basically close Eastern Germany off and sort of violate that agreement. Uh, the only problem is they also split Berlin four ways, and Berlin is in East Germany. So if this is Germany-ish, kind of looks like this, and the Soviets control this zone, Berlin's in that zone. So you had, um, it was a Great Britain, uh, US, and France controlling these three zones, and then the USSR over here. But in Berlin, you have this also split, you know, three ways, however it was split. Uh, Great Britain, U.S., France, and USSR. So the, uh, the troops and ambassadors and officials uh, for the U.S., France, and Great Britain are going to be stuck in Berlin. And there's no way for them to peacefully enter to provide these guys with supplies because the Soviets closed off. So, you remember how they uh, fed them? Oh, with the Berlin airlift. Yeah, it was the Berlin airlift. So this is kind of the first <clears throat> example of uh, the Cold War. This tension between the two sides. Uh, and again, that's the Berlin Airlift. That's how we provide supplies to them until that, that um, I guess you would say, the closing off of East Germany is going to at least open up to those officials over there. Um, that's going to be a problem too later on, is that when people are trying to escape this Eastern Bloc, because it very quickly becomes bleak and jobless and oppressive, so people are fleeing in mass. And one of the easiest ways for them to do that is to just go into Berlin and cross over to the West, uh, Western Power side and then hop on a plane out. So in, I think, 1961, that's when they build the infamous Berlin Wall that prevents people from uh, escaping into the uh, Allied parts of, <clears throat> or the Western parts of Berlin. 1951? 60? 61, I think, is when the wall's built. <clears throat> All right. Yeah, they were losing much people that way. 
And they tried to say it was, oh, it's to keep Westerners out of the East, but it's like, no, the fences and guns are pointed in. So it's very clearly not to prevent the Easterners from going West. All right, so that's basically the, the setup of the Cold War, um, as far as tensions go. And the reason why this is called the Cold War is because <clears throat> there's no direct fighting. So again, this is the development of the Cold War, which lasts roughly from 1940, probably seven. You could say it started right after World War I, but this Berlin Air looks kind of the first real example of that in 47. So you could choose 45, 46, but we'll, we'll choose 47. It's 1947 to about 1991-ish. You could also argue it ended in 1989 when the Soviets lost the Eastern European countries during the revolutions of 1989, but the Soviet Union itself is gonna exist until 1991. So roughly speaking, that's about the 50-ish year, 40 to 50 year um, era in which we are defined by what we call proxy wars. Proxy wars. And proxy is um, basically means indirect. So I'm talking to you now directly, but if you're in another city, I have to use a proxy. I use a telephone, right? And the telephone and the wires going to you that communicate between us, that's the proxy. Like I'm talking to you directly, that's just us talking. But if you're away and I'm talking to you on a screen or on a phone, the phone or the screen are going to be uh, the proxies. So the proxies here are in conflicts like the Korean War, Chinese Civil War, Greece and Turkey, Soviet-Afghan conflict, Vietnam War, all these wars. The United States, US versus USSR never fight directly. And the reason why they can't fight directly is uh, after I think 1951, the Soviets also have atomic weapons. There was a period after World War I, two, sorry, World War II, the US is the undisputed number one power in the world. Best economy, biggest military. We are the only ones that had atomic weapons at the time. But in 1951, as soon as the Soviets had atomic weapons, that really evens the game. Uh, so the fact that these two superpowers can't fight because of these nuclear weapons, is a diplomatic policy known as mutually assured destruction. And that's the idea that we can't fight because if we do and we nuke each other or, or drop atomic bombs on each other, we wipe out each other's countries and very quickly, getting to the 1960s, they actually have enough uh, nuclear weapons to, if they drop them all, it would eliminate human life uh, on the planet. I mean, at least, at least human life above the surface. Now, if you went like deep underground, you'd be okay, but what kind of life is that? You have to stay down there for decades before you could come back up and it wasn't as radio, it wasn't radioactive enough to die. And then be like, what, what living entities would even be left at that point? So, um, mutually assured destruction. They could not fight because both sides have atomic weapons and pretty quickly they have enough to end the uh, human existence in the world. So, they can't fight directly. So a proxy war means across the world, the United States is supporting any country or group that are anti-communist. And the Soviets are supporting any group that is communist. So we'll see in all these conflicts we talk about, so like here's a bunch of proxy conflicts. We'll go, I'll go over them briefly. Um, kind of in order, Greece and Turkey are really the first examples of this in 1947. Uh, we also have the Chinese Civil War. That's roughly 1945 to 1949. We also have, we're not going to do all of them, just do the main ones, Korean War from 1950, 50 or 51? We'll just say 50 to 53. Uh, Vietnam War, which has different dates. You can choose as a starting or any point. We'll just say 1955 to 75 to keep it simple. Uh, the U.S. wasn't there the entire time. And then um, the Soviet-Afghan conflict or war. And that is, I believe, 1979 to 89. All of these are proxy wars. And in all of these, it's democratic groups, or at least anti-communist groups, versus communist groups. And in both cases, the United States is going to provide either direct or indirect support to anti-communist forces. And the Soviet Union is going to pr pr provide it, uh, direct or indirect support to communist forces. Uh, in neither case, though, will both countries be present. So if the United States is already in the conflict, like Vietnam, Soviet Union is not going to get involved, or China. 
they're just going to be sending aid to communist forces. Uh, in the Soviet-Afghan conflicts, if the Soviets are there, American forces will not be there, but we do provide support, technology, aid, and training uh, to the Afghan fighters because at the time they represent anti-communists. Now again, doesn't mean we're necessarily allies with these fighters in the Afghan conflict because one of the groups and people we gave support to was what would later become Al-Qaeda under Osama bin Laden. But at the time, we didn't mind because they were uh, anti-communist fighting against the Soviet Union. All right, so that's the Cold War. And the way this really starts is this Greece and Turkey. And I'll go through these just kind of really quickly. Um, just give you a brief rundown. We don't need to go into too much detail. You just need to know that these proxy wars exist and uh, basically what the sides are. So the Vietnam War, was it 55 or Yeah, 55 to 75. The United States was not there that entire time, though. Uh, for throughout the beginning portions of it, we were just sending aid and like military advisors. We don't get directly involved primarily until Lyndon B. Johnson issues or Congress issues the Tonkin Gulf Resolution and allows LBJ, the president of the time, to use military forces in Vietnam directly. All right, so I'll run down these super quick. Uh, Greece and Turkey. After the war, there's instability in Greece and Turkey. Uh, you have democratic governments, but there are large communist movements that are trying to rebel or displace these democratic governments. Uh, these um, communist forces have the support of the Soviet Union to some degree, but what we do is we make sure that they get plenty of aid from the United States and Great Britain uh, to the anti-communist force here, in this case, the democratic governments. So democratic governments are supported by US, uh, communist rebels are supported by the USSR, at least slightly. And in this case, the support given to these governments in Greece and Turkey by the United States is enough to hold off the communist surge. So here in Greece and Turkey, we have a victory for the West, so I'll put a W here for West, as in a Western victory. This is also where Truman, by the way, who was the president at the time, uh, officially announced the Truman Doctrine, or policy, and that is pretty much just the policy of containment, containment of communism. So the idea here is wherever communism is popping up, which again is very anti-American uh, as far as ideals go, it's anti-democracy, uh, because it's very authoritarian. It's anti-freedom uh, and individuality, because you're essentially trying to homogenize people and distribute things evenly. Um, and of course, those have catastrophic consequences, which we will we'll talk about that in AP or AP World. Uh, but the Truman Doctrine is wherever it's starting to pop up, whether it's Greece and Turkey, or in China, or later in Korea, Vietnam, so, or, the, or Afghanistan, when these communist forces are gathering or fighting, we support whoever is against them. So sometimes that means we support, you know, freedom-based, democratic, capitalistic institutions. It's like, yeah, yes, that aligns with us. Sometimes, though, it's brutal dictators that are just awful people. Like, for example, um, we support Batista, or sorry, no, no, yeah, we support Batista in Cuba, terrible guy, uh, very much a crummy capitalist. Um, we have... Um, we kick out a legitimate government in Chile, replaced with Pinochet, a rather brutal dictator. We support later in Uganda a guy named Idi Amin, who's a, a, another brutal dictator. We kick out, I can't remember who we replaced it with, but we kicked out, it was Allende, I'm forgetting the name, in Guatemala, we also kicked out a, a, an elected official uh, because he had some socialist policies and we wanted to protect our fruit companies. So, not a clean record on the United States by any part. Uh, it's just whoever's anti-communist. So whether that means a good government, in this case, in Greece and Turkey, yay for us. But it's also, at times, um, despotic, tyrannical individuals such as, you know, Batista or B Pinochet or whoever. All right, so containment. So again, wherever we see this communism arising, we are there uh, on the spot to try to stop it by either directly invading if the Soviets aren't there, or if the Soviets are already there, we just provide aid to any anti-communist forces. They're going to do the same thing. So in the case of the Chinese Civil War, we are going to support the nationalists, led by Chiang Kai-shek. The U.S. is going to support them, and the communists are going to be supported by, led by Mao Zedong, the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, led by, again, Mao Zedong, 
very famous person in world history and Chinese history. A big failure, just like Stalin, as far as leading to the deaths of millions of people, persecuting people based on their class and identity, like just the regular authoritarian communist regime. Uh, that is supported by the USSR, but before Mao got a chance to really hone in and kill tens of millions of people with his terrible policies and persecution, uh, he actually had the support of the peasants, um, and that's going to cause them to be victorious, actually, in the Chinese Civil War. And in 1949, of course, China becomes officially communist, ruled by the Chinese Communist Party. Nationalists did a terrible job, though. They, they, they selfishly spoiled aid. They were not good in the eyes of most, um, I guess, Chinese, regular Chinese people. Korean War. This one ends with a stalemate. So no win. Um, actually, the war never officially ended. It had an armistice, just, just a ceasefire. There's no treaty, which is why they're still in North and South Korea. Um, in this case, the North, which is communist, is supported by the USSR, and now China, who's on the team of the USSR. And uh, the South is supported by the US and the United Nations forces. And again, this is going to end in a stalemate. It's kind of a back and forth. Uh, north of the South is pushed back to the North, then it's settled again at the 30th parallel, which is like the midway point, and that's where the ceasefire occurs. So this is a stalemate, but it's an example of the United States leading the charge along with the United Nations, uh, which is like the League of Nations 2.0, um, to try to stop communism. In Vietnam, we have uh, definitely an Eastern Bloc victory, right, these communist forces. This, by the way, is also known as the Second World and the First World. Those are misnomers, those are misused nowadays. We think of First World as a rich country, which, I mean, technically, most Western countries fit as a First World country, and most of them are rather wealthy, but um, Third World is used as a term for impoverished countries, whereas a developing is probably better. Third World means not aligned with anyone. First World means a United States uh, or their allies. Second World means Soviet Union and their allies. And again, Third World meant not aligned. People that were later not taking aid or helping either side. Countries like India, later Yugoslavia, Egypt, Ghana. China drops out of the Second World in the 1970s and becomes uh, non-aligned. So uh, basically these are Cold War terms. Anyways, Vietnam. We have North Vietnam to be supported by uh, the USSR and China, the communist forces led by Ho Chi Minh. And the South is going to be supported by the United States. Initially France, because it was their colony, but pretty much just the United States. And that's going to be one that, due to, I guess we'd say, ineffectiveness um, and opposition at home, uh, domestically, which we'll talk about in the 1960s, uh, the United States is just going to be unable to win this long, bleeding conflict, and they're going to pull out, and then the North is going to invade and conquer the South, and Vietnam becomes communist. Uh, in the Soviet-Afghan conflict, we have a Western victory um, because the Soviets basically suffer the same problems as the um, Americans in Vietnam. It's just a conflict full of guerrilla warfare and unending attacks and bleeding of soldiers out, lives and, and monies and things like that. So they eventually just have to leave as well like we did in Vietnam. In that case, you had, of course, the Soviets themselves uh, supporting themselves uh, versus... Uh, anti-communist Afghan people who are supported by the United States and our <clears throat> intelligence agency, the CIA, providing weapons, finances, and training. So that's a brief overview. There's, <clears throat> there's other examples too. Cuban Revolution, <coughs> uh, supporting Pinochet in Chile, Idi Min, Uganda, etc. But these are the main conflicts. Uh, and again, the thing you want to know here is no direct fighting between the First and Second World here, or at least the United States and the Soviet Union, because we could literally end the world if we um, engage in nuclear warfare. There's a couple points in history we almost did. There was a thing called the Cuban Missile Crisis where the Soviets tried to, in 1962 or 63, tried to put nuclear missiles right next to the United States in communist Cuba. And uh, Kennedy basically said, you know, if you put these missiles, ship these missiles, we're gonna stop you. And so the U.S. Navy was positioned, and the uh, Soviet ships ended up turning around instead of placing those missiles in, because that would have probably been the start of World War III and possibly the end of civilization as we know it. So the world almost ended in the 60s, but hey, we're here. <coughs> All right, so that's the Truman Doctrine, and that's, that's a basic overview of the Cold War. So for the next 40 or 50 years, 
depending on when you place the start and end of the Cold War, we're going to have the United States and their allies in the First World, the Soviets and, the, and their allies in the Second World, sort of trying to spread communism or contain communism, depending on your side, around the world. And that's going to be a big determinant for um, <clears throat> foreign policy. You guys understand that one? Sweet. So that is the Cold War as a whole, internationally across the world. I was hoping to do that quicker, but it's really hard to condense that. That's about as condensed as you can make it while still having an understanding of what it actually is. Okay. <clears throat> so let's focus on then the Cold War at home in the United States, the domestic Cold War, because this is an excellent example of why we dislike or we should dislike authoritarianism. So in the 1940s and 50s, well, especially the 50s, we had sort of a movement <clears throat> led by the authoritarian right. Now, this is a movement that's been growing here, you know, in, in recent years with the authoritarian left trying to control speech and dictate who can do what and say what and all of these things. It's important to know our lessons from history that the right and left wing are both guilty of authoritarianism. I mean, the left's got a whole bunch of examples. French Revolution uh, with the Jacobins under, under the... Um, under Robespierre and the Committee of Public Safety. You've got Stalin, Pol Pot, Mao. I mean, the list goes on there. Uh, the Cubans, the Venezuelans. The authoritarian left really, really steers people wrong. But so does the authoritarian right. You've got Hitler. You've got, um, what else do you got? You've got McCarthyism in the 1950s. Uh, you've got any fascist example like uh, Italy as well. Um, those are all examples of the authoritarian right. So if you ever start going to the authoritarian left or right, doesn't matter what you think your idea of the world is, uh, things go badly. So that's why we've got to resist authoritarianism, which is anytime people are trying to infringe on freedoms uh, or fix problems with simple solutions in that way, uh, stay away from it <clears throat> is a, good, is a good, good way, good motto. So domestic Cold War. Here we have kind of what we call the second Red Scare. There is a spy ring that's uncovered by the Canadians. Uh, they leaked out some atomic secrets to the Soviets. There were some Soviet spies in uh, high positions in the government, and that really worried people. So we have what's called basically, again, the second Red Scare, and this one's going to be far worse uh, for people. Uh, we had Sokhum and Benzetti, which of course is a terrible example, but here we have a lot of uh, pointing and, 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 and blaming here without, without good evidence, right? So um, just like now, if you accuse somebody of something, whatever the crime is, it's become popular with social media, just pointing the finger at somebody and accusing them and maybe coming up with one clip of something they said out of context, all of a sudden that person's life is ruined, right? This is very similar now compared to what happened in the 1950s with McCarthyism. Now, obviously we didn't have Twitter and things like that and edited video clips. Um, which is what people are using now. But just know this is a good example of a similar theme of history repeating itself. So do your, do your best to resist it. Like if you see these clips or these accusations, look into it. Look for the whole clip, right? Look for the evidence behind it to see if they actually did these things because people are having their lives ruined because of it. Like those, those kids, it, the, the Catholic school kids or whatever, right? They, they had their lives potentially ruined. Uh, you had a bunch of people accused of stuff. Um, in the last year or two that there was no evidence for, that now their lives are ruined, businesses are ruined, etc. cetera. Um, so watch out for that. This, this is more of an authoritarian left movement now, but this happened on the right too. So here's an example of how it happened on the right. So on the right, it was definitely bipartisan as far as opposition to, I'll probably put that, bipartisan opposition to communism. But the left's always been more sympathetic to socialist policies. So Democrats at the time were often seen as too soft on communism, like not hardcore enough. Uh, as a result, anyone who wasn't hardcore enough or, or they were realistically sympathetic to people um, and, and agreed that capitalism could use some refinements, they were seen, or, or they didn't want to punish people as severely and label them as traitors and, and remove them, essentially. Uh, they were seen as soft and even sympathizers themselves. So it became very dangerous not to, you know, join in on the finger pointing and, you know, like basically convicting people without evidence for fear of being convicted yourself. So um, 
again, we have Republicans being a lot more hardcore and the Democrats being a little softer, but again, that drew them a lot of criticism. So uh, after the spy ring is going to be uncovered in, uh, like I said, I believe it was the Canadians that did it, uh, that's going to spread a lot of fear. So the Republicans are going to lead the charge here by forming the House of Un-American Activities Committee, also known as HUAC. And this is an organization that's going to specifically look, look into anyone who has communist, anarchist, or socialist sympathies. Um, and it's going to, of course, and many times during the 1950s, violate some of our amendments, uh, like our right to, uh, uh, you know, requiring a warrant for search and seizures. They're going to do some illegal wiretappings. Um, they're going to uh, harass certain people, uh, watch them without reasonable cause, all sorts of, you know, some subtle, some not subtle, <clears throat> constitutional violations of people's rights. Um, <clears throat> this can be partially led by uh, Vice President Nixon. He's a very, he's a very active anti-communist. Um, and uh, in the 1950s, we're going to have some very negative movements where people that agree we should have free speech, like for example, even in the 1950s, people are scared. If you believe in some socialist policies, you should be able to support that, discuss it, be a part of a debate or a group that is maybe pro-socialist or pro-communist. However, back then, that might get you labeled as traitorous. <clears throat> that might get you blacklisted. In fact, we had that. We had blacklisting. Uh, people that were seen as communist sympathizers, uh, like members of communist party or socialist party or whatever, uh, were blacklisted and usually had their careers destroyed, could not be hired um, or removed from the government. They also required them to uh, take oaths of loyalty to the United States or against communism. <clears throat> um, they had to pledge, of course, not to be communists, all sorts of things that shouldn't be allowed here in the United States because we should have that openness and freedom of speech allowed to us. I mean, it's part of our constitution and our ideals. Like we're a very, we're a very libertarian government, or I guess you should say nation, so this was very much against that. It's like, okay, we disagree with them, it doesn't mean you should silence them, and that's what they're trying to do here, and that's what some people are trying to do now. <clears throat> All right, um, so the reason why we, I mentioned McCarthyism is because a lot of this is led by a guy named Senator uh, Joseph McCarthy. <clears throat> so McCarthy, I was going to spell his name, how many C's are in there? Two C's. Oh, he's only the charge by accusing a lot of people in the government of being traitors or spies of the Soviets, and he's going to ruin a lot of people's lives. Now, he eventually gets too power-hungry with this and starts um, accusing people that have just no ties with anyone in the military, in the government. And that's going to lose his credibility, and he's eventually going to be you know, exposed as a, uh, a fraud. But um, in the meantime, though, he does go through and, and ruin quite a few people's lives. Uh, we have a group called the Hollywood Ten that spoke out against, it's more than just 10 people, by the way, that spoke out against <clears throat> McCarthyism and this Red Scare and uh, censorship and violation of uh, people's privacy. And these people, of course, are going to be uh, blacklisted and made almost unhirable at the time because they're viewed as traitors, which is, of course, wrong just to disagree with somebody. So that is, roughly speaking, uh, the domestic Cold War. And again, an example of right-wing authoritarianism where they're going to infringe on people's rights to free speech, freedom of choice, etc., by being overly concerned with Soviet spies and the spread of communism. Does that kind of make sense? All right. That is largely the 1950s. Also the 1950s. So I'll just put that 1950s. Also in the 1950s, we have a large culture change. So, as you see um, a few things. So, for example, we have a lot of new technology. We have a big, uh, for, first of all, we have a big economic boom. So, cultural change, 1950s. We have a large economic boom. Uh, the factories, there's almost full employment. People come back from the military. There's a thing called the GI Bill of Rights passed by, uh, I think it was FDR. Mm -hmm. This makes, it, it does a bunch of things. It gives you like access to cheaper mortgages, lower interest rates for houses, helps you um, fund and find cheap tuition for high school or college. Uh, it also gave them, I think, a year's worth of pay 
uh, unemployment pay when they got back so they could help find a job. So it, it really helped soldiers, and there were millions of them coming back from the war, uh, to immediately get into a career or a vocational school or a college. And uh, I think they even had like these basic plans for like a house you could build yourself. I don't think it was pretty part of the GI Bill, but there was a big movement to get these soldiers who had fought during World War II uh, and, and jumpstart their lives. So the GI Bill of Rights is going to help, of course, soldiers get houses, training, etc. They're also going to start a lot of families. This is where we have the baby boom generation. So all these soldiers come back, they start families, the economy's growing, uh, production's going. We're producing most of the world's goods to areas like Japan and, and Europe who just had their entire infrastructure destroyed. Um, we've got martial aid going out with loans and those payments are coming back. So, so America is booming in the 50s and early part of the 60s. And as a result, we get these baby boomers. Uh, families started, stable families, they have their kids, um, and that generation right now is actually getting ready to retire and may just totally bankrupt our social security program. But um, that's who the baby boom generation is. So you have a lot of movement to what are called the suburbs. So it's like not city, not country, it's those houses outside of the city. So it's not the vertical city, it's just like an independent house with a, like a lawn, and then you've got these neighborhoods of houses that look very similar. Those are the suburbs. This is where a lot of middle class, mostly white, but also blacks and Hispanics too, and Asians, are gonna move out into these communities, and they're going to, it's gonna be a big cultural change. There's also movement too, to what's called the Sunbelt. Sunbelt region. And that is like the lower southern part of the United States. So if this is like the United States, roughly speaking, right? Ooh. That's pretty good US to come up with pretty quickly. Uh, the Sun Belt's kind of like this region here. So south, southeastern, southwestern states, Florida, Georgia, Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, California, uh, all of these states are going to flood with people. I think from 19... 50 to like 19, the 1980s and 90s, um, the amount of people in these states increased, depending on the state, from four to 12 times, which gave them far more electoral power in uh, Congress and uh, regarding presidential uh, elections. But it's just a big movement of people to different areas in the United States and, of course, how they lay themselves out in cities and settlements. Uh, culturally, also, we have a lot of new technologies that are going to be widely available, cheaply, because of the manufacturing and the boom and all the money that's available. So you have the widespread, um, widespread TVs, uh, new music like rock and roll, the TV shows that go with it, new advertisements, uh, drive-ins. What else do they have? Ah, I'm forgetting one other thing. Well, that was pretty much it. And this is just going to be a time of, yeah, prosperity and growth. And this is kind of where people get the idea of like a nuclear family where, oh, this is an important thing to know. In the 40s and 50s, we don't quite have the widespread use of appliances. So here, here's an example. 100 years ago, housework took six to eight hours, took the whole day. So a, a woman that stayed at home as a housewife they weren't just twiddling their thumbs, they were literally doing stuff the entire time. Like, they actually had to like wash the clothes, right? Or really wash the dishes and really clean the house, right? And if you go like 200 years, they weren't even buying like clothes and things like that. They had to make the clothes, right? So the work that women had to do around the house is gonna start shifting in the 1950s. So we start having this boom of appliances like, for example, irons and vacuums and dishwashers and laundry machines, which take what do, do, which, which takes what did take women six, seven, eight, nine hours to do, you know, 100, 200 years ago in a day, like a real actual job. Um, it takes them now one or two hours to do these things, right? So that's going to start happening in the 1950s, and that's, of course, going to have a big impact on the uh, second wave feminist movement in the 1960s. Uh, but yes, we still do have that, that traditional idea of guy works, woman stays home and take care of the children and the kids uh, because we don't really have those appliances yet. And also we don't really have consistent birth control. 1960s, that's going to change though. Uh, and as a result, you're going to have a lot of women that are able to pursue careers and have a lot more idle time. And that's going to, of course, um, encourage them strongly to move for change and allowing them opportunity 
in the business and political world because, well, they've got so much time and choice regarding um, child rearing. <clears throat> I don't know. What? I don't know. What about it? That's the thing. Right. Okay. So, what are we looking here for? Well, there's several things, but there's like Equal Pay Act too, as well. There's we'll, we'll talk about them. Mm -hmm. um, so, another change too is we have a, a boom in what's called evangelicalism uh, in the 1950s. In fact, you have TV evangelicalists like um, Billy Graham, and there was a big conservative, I guess you'd say, movement. So, evangelicals. People that were getting excited about Christianity and a renewed sense of the Bible and all of that. Um, you're going to have church attendance skyrocket from, I have the number here. It's like it's something of sort of doubles from like 60 to 120 million or something. Yeah, it doubles. It doubles, doubles from 1945 to 1960, going from roughly... Um, I think it was about 50 million, you know, 1945, 214 million by 1960. So a, a big movement of Americans to churches, I guess you would say. So it definitely establishes like a very white middle class Christian culture. So they call it WASP culture, white Anglo-Saxon uh, Protestants. So this is where that culture sort of embeds itself. Uh, but there's some problems here, though, and then we'll talk about those in a minute here. And that, of course, is the blatant hypocrisy of having limitations on people. So the fact that women can't, you know, pursue any job they want or political life if they want to. The fact that we still have segregation in parts of the world. The fact that we still have homosexuals that are deemed as uh, having a mental disorder up all the way up to 1971. Um, you know, not allowing homosexual marriage. Things like that uh, are going to be a blatant violation of what should be fundamental American ideals. And that's what people are going to challenge and issue changes for in the 1960s. But what I want you to understand is this is kind of how the authoritarian right wing and very right wing policies and approaches like Christian fundamentalist approaches sort of dominated society in the 50s and early 60s. But that's going to be challenged by several factors, including new technologies and appliances for women, um, the TV sort of showing the problems of segregation throughout the world, LGBTQ movements, environmentalist movements, um, all those, especially at the time, rightfully opposing systematic limitations on them. Like segregation should just be a no-brainer, that it's illegal, wrong, and terrible, and out. You know, not allowing women the, the, the right and the choice, um, you know, to pursue a career or a political life or delay childbirth to when they're ready or whatever. Like, th those should be no-brainers. But previously, they had been sort of enforced throughout the world. And the West is the first one to break away from that in the 1960s. So I think that's what we talk about next is, yes, the impact of postmodernism and social change. All right, we good on the 1950s and 50s culture? Yeah. All right, yeah. Um, the HUAC, what does it stand for? House of Un-American Activities Committee. Those are people looking for communists, even though, well, there were some communist spies, but they overlooked for them. Mm -hmm. And then after rock and roll, what's the civil rights laws? <clears throat> TV rock and roll advertisements are going to change a lot. They're going to really cater to, they're, they're going to do a lot more psychological research into advertisements. A guy named, uh, crap, what's his name? John Watson, who's a behaviorist. He's going to kind of be, I, I can't remember the exact, the exact, um, what's it called, controversy. I think he like, he was at Stanford or something as a behaviorist, but then he cheated on his wife, who was the daughter of one of the presidents there. <laughs> so he got like, he got, I might have the details mixed up. He, he had some sort of affair, which at the time was seen as morally wrong, but also he pissed off some high ups. And so he left psychology and took his knowledge and applied it to advertising. So we see a big change and shift in advertising. Like it's, it's studied psychologically so they could find out like what works and all that. And if they test subliminal messaging and then that becomes illegal and all that kind of stuff. Associating with celebrities and using uh, <clears throat> peripheral to the route persuasion, stuff like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Exactly. So that's how advertising changes. And then of course you have just cultural changes like drive-ins, concerts, 
dances, things like that. But again, it's still very middle class Christian at this point. Uh, there's not real, really, there's definitely still systematic limitations to people that need to be removed for America to fully realize its actual, um, its ideals. <clears throat> All right, 1960s, <clears throat> some social change. So some of the early inspirations for this, or at least this general movement, right? And, and by the way, 1960s is like appropriate social justice because we still had, like I said, systematic limitations on certain minorities, women, uh, different sexual orientations, etc., uh, which is obviously totally wrong. And uh, a lot of it's gonna be started though by the universities uh, and activism, and that's gonna be triggered by something called postmodernism. I won't go too much into this, but basically postmodernists believed that <clears throat> language is a powerful tool and people would use words to control people, and that historically, what it's at least turned into now, is that American society is based on Western society, which is essentially white patriarchal ideas that enforce the current hierarchy, which, which is what they believed was putting white males at the top. And of course, if you looked at the laws across the West and the systems in which they ran, you'd be like, well, yeah, look, women are limited here, minorities are limited here, uh, and it's clearly present. Now, the rest of the world, of course, has it much worse, but. They were correct in the t at the time. Those, those groups were limited systematically, and we needed to get rid of that. Of course, we're going to use you know, Enlightenment thought as the crux for getting rid of those things, which flies in the face of that theory entirely. But nonetheless, nonetheless this was driven by uh, a very anti... What's the word I'm looking for? Anti-oppression? And the thing they saw as the oppressors were white males. White male patriarchy, essentially. <clears throat> All right. Um, Regardless of whether or not their fundamental, you know, thesis is correct or not, uh, some of the things they want to get rid of were absolutely appropriate to get rid of. <clears throat> All right. So, where do I go from here? This is going to start in the universities, and the humanities specifically, English, history, etc., social sciences. Uh, and that's going to be based a lot, largely on activism, uh, teaching students, or at least students themselves, gathering together to try to protest and bring about change. So one of the first movements <clears throat> that really stuck out, at least for the university goes, are the uh, Berkeley free speech, is the Berkeley free speech movement. Right over here, right over the hills, actually. I think it was 1964 to 65. That is where students for off and on for an entire year were protesting their right to academic freedom, freedom of speech, etc. Very, very, a very good cause, right? One we would support, one that's actually under threat now by the university system, uh, but one that they were fighting for appropriately in the 60s. <clears throat> um, Berkeley's quite proud of that. I know SFSU was right alongside them across the bay, um, and that was a big university movement, was activism and opposition to this limitation of speech. Because don't forget, like, the authoritarian right was still present, like HUAC was still a thing, anti-communism was still a thing. Those limits on free speech were fresh, fresh in the memory of people um, and being labeled as a traitor just for disagreeing. So that free speech movement very much had an appropriate agenda to open up free speech. Like I said, now they're kind of trying to backtrack it and limit certain ones, but they had the right idea in the 60s for sure. Yeah. All right, we'll talk about the civil rights movement too, which actually precedes this a bit, but I'm just starting with the topic of uh, these colleges. Okay, <clears throat> part of the activism, by the way, is going to be, and, and postmodernism in, in general, is what we call the counterculture movement. And this is a movement that is opposed to that sort of WASP, entrenched WASP culture, right? Now, there's nothing wrong with taking part in WASP culture as long as you're not forcing it on other people. But that's what was going on at the time. So they did not like the fact that, you know, middle class white Christian ideals are being forced on everybody else in the United States, uh, appropriately opposing them at the time. <clears throat> so counterculture movement is basically, <clears throat> there are some radicals in here that don't represent a reasonable, you know, re that aren't a res reasonable rep representation of this movement, but um, some of the themes are anti-imperialism, or colonialism, I should say, at the time. 
<clears throat> so they very much support Western powers leaving Africa, Asia, etc., to let themselves determine and run themselves appropriately. Uh, anti capitalism, sometimes misguided and sometimes not misguided. Like, there's definitely some negative aspects of capitalism, especially uh, free market capitalism. Like I said, monopolies, cartels, crony capitalism, all the stuff that progressivists were, were opposed to were very much a problem and very much should be uh, fought against. And um, what else is not a big one? Just basically anti oppression, really. Anything they saw as oppressive. Uh, anything they saw as controlling, whether it's speech or lifestyle choices, uh, culturally too. So you got a big, um, another big part, at least in the United States, is a sort of uh, sexual revolution. That's largely led by the research of a guy named Alfred Kinsey, which you guys remember from AP Psych. <coughs> uh, he made sex a lot less taboo. He did a lot of research and surveys into sexual life of, of couples, which have, you know, previously across the world and in the West, uh, sex had been a very taboo and private topic, but he sort of progressed it and normalized it. Um, so this this looking into the sexual behavior of people, finding the women's you know side of it as well, um, talking to different couples about writing books that just couldn't even be printed fast enough to be uh, purchased and read, uh, as well as um, sort of experimentation with new uh, drugs, psychotel psychedelics, hallucinogens, depressants, etc. All this became a very um, indicative, these became indicative of this counterculture movement. Uh, these themes, mixed in or by themselves, uh, were all a big part of this counterculture uh, movement. So, some of the movements we see pop out of this counterculture movement, and again, counterculture mean like anti WASP, essentially, white Anglo Saxon Protestant. And again, I'll reiterate, nothing wrong with being a part of WASP culture, but when you're enforcing it on others, that's when it becomes a problem, at least here in the West, right? So these guys are very appropriately opposing that. Now, if you just hate that culture and you want to stop it, that's not a good motivation. But if you're trying to reduce the uh, limitations of that culture on others, then very appropriately placed. And uh, a lot of people were motivated by that. So we could start with. Let's start with the anti-imperial. So, an example of anti-imperialism is we wanted countries that were controlled largely by Westerners to uh, be allowed to self-determine. One of those was gonna be uh, Vietnam. So we had a lot of opposition to the Vietnam War. Now initially, we weren't that involved. We pretty much just sent advisors and aid and some volunteers uh, to Vietnam in like the 50s. Uh, in early 60s, when the southern Vietnamese forces based in Saigon were struggling against the communist forces of North Vietnam, with Ho led by Ho Chi Minh. And uh, that's going to be the, and we also, by the way, supported France trying to reassert control over it when they lost from the Japanese. But as time goes on, uh, the, the Americans are going to become more and more involved because the communist side gains more and more momentum. So. After an incident in which North Vietnamese forces shot at an American ship in Tonkin uh, Bay or the Tonkin Gulf, we have Congress pass what's called the Tonkin Gulf Resolution, which let the president at the time, Lyndon B. Johnson, uh, just the president in general, by the way, not him particularly, but he was the president at the time, it allowed the president all the powers necessary uh, to deal with uh, the situation in Vietnam. So there's no declaration of war here, but the president can now use the military in Vietnam as he pleases uh, to prop up democracy and, and stop the spread of communism, at least in Asia. And that's gonna happen. So now we see direct US involvement into the war, and this is not gonna be a successful war. It's successful in that, just like the Soviets do in Afghanistan, we roll in with our modernized military, take all the important positions, cities, etc. But the resistance is throughout the whole nation, essentially. Uh, they're gonna use guerrilla tactics, hit and runs, hiding within the population, etc. Um, and it's gonna be frustrating for soldiers. So as a result, they're gonna use a lot of seek and destroy missions. Where they go into the uh, villages, etc. Where these 
uh, Viet Cong fighters, which again are communist fighters in Vietnam. <clears throat> These Viet Cong fighters are uh, hiding out, and they're trying to find them. So they go in seeking uh, them out, and you have lots of instances um, of murder or rape or persecution and violence as these soldiers go looking through. We have examples like the Miley Massacre, My Lai Massacre, uh, which get a lot of publicity. And that's gonna really, really, really put a negative image on the Americans in this war, especially because it goes for so many years. Like this is going from um, 1955, we weren't there in the beginning, but to 1975, like we're there for years and years and years. And it gets to the point that we have to reinstitute the draft. So we've got people going to the war that don't want to. Uh, we're spending millions of dollars on that support. It's not going well because even though we hold all of major positions, these active forces are still resisting. And this is the first war that's going to be televised. So all the terrible stuff that goes along with war, the good and the bad, are going to be <clears throat> shown to the media and then brought home. So they see these seek and destroy missions. They see the uh, uh, firebombing of villages and forests, the destruction of... Um, um, the peoples of Vietnam, the terrain, the, they hear about all of the um, psychological issues that are going on, the rampant drug use by soldiers, deaths by that drug use, things like that. So Vietnam just gets a very, very, very bad, I guess, image in the mind of Americans, especially with these, these new themes of being anti-imperialist. So as a result, for the first time in American history, we have large-scale opposition to our presence there, uh, and driven by this sort of postmodern uh, activist campus-based movement, we have a lot of protests by this new generation of baby boomers, uh, or near baby boomers, that are going to try to convince the government to leave Vietnam. And uh, we're going to see a lot of student protests, <clears throat> for example, at Kentucky State University, and this is one that got really famous because this is the one where the Ohio State, no, someone's National Guard, it was Illinois State National Guard. I realize it's Kentucky State, but it was somebody else's National Guard actually fired on the students, unarmed students, and they killed several of them. And that was, of course, covered um, by the media. And that was a, a great, what they felt, example of People trying to be, bring about peaceful change, but then being oppressed by uh, these power systems that were in place that postmodernism uh, talked about. So this is going to really, really turn people against the, uh, at least their opinions against the war. And that's going to eventually lead us to leave the war entirely, especially when Nixon starts bombing Cambodia, a neutral country next to it because of supply lines running down uh, yeah, through the Ho Chi Minh Trail to South Vietnam. So I'll, I'll even put, it, put that in there, uh, Cambodia bombings. And it's going to be a war, again, that's going to stir a lot of protests against the United States. And this is a, just a sign of a, a, a big cultural shift here. Whereas before, it would be unquestionable allegiance and loyalty to the United States, whatever they're doing. And now it's a reasonable questioning of what they're doing, if it's working, and in this case, not leaving the cause and uh, wanting to leave it. All right, so that's the Vietnam War and our opposition to that. We also have, too, a significant and uh, proper opposition to racial oppression. Right? We still have segregation in the South. Mm -hmm. So, in the 1950s and 60s, we have what's called the Civil Rights Movement. <clears throat> and there's a few fronts to this. There's a legal front. There's a peaceful movement front, and there's a militant front. And the least successful, of course, is the militant front. Uh, but uh, the first two, the court legal movement and the um, <clears throat> peaceful demonstration movement, are going to be quite successful. So uh, in the 50s, you have the NAACP and others uh, supporting mostly black attorneys, but white attorneys too, to challenge some of these un-American laws, like Plessy versus Ferguson, right? The separate but equal. Uh, so you have, of course, again, the NAACP supporting a lot of this, and then black attorneys and, and some white attorneys. Uh, one of them being, um, one black attorney being Thurgood Marshall, a prominent one. Uh, they're going to attack segregation legally. So one of the first ways they do that is in the course, court case Brown versus Board of Education. 
1954, in which they convinced the court, Supreme Court, unanimously, nine to zero, that um, segregation is inherently unequal, and they end it in public schools, which is a landmark case, because now, if you just said segregation is illegal and, and, un, and unequal in public schools, that, of course, should apply elsewhere, too, not just in schools. That should apply in all public places, and that's sort of what it's going to lead to, is the fight to end segregation outside of the schools, and they can cite this court case, as well as the 14th Amendment, which is what this amendment is going to cite to, or sorry, this court case is going to cite, cite in the first place. Which again, if you forgot, equal protection of the law, Reconstruction Amendment. All right, so uh, that's going to, of course, allow for desegregation. There's some opposition, of course, uh, to this from uh, whites in the South, and uh, it's not going to matter, ultimately, because the federal government is going to back this case. Eisenhower, for example, sends uh, paratroopers to escort many of the first uh, black students, like the Little Rock Nine, mm -hmm. uh, to school. So this decision does have the backing of the president of the federal government, and it's, it's, it's going to stick. We also see several cases later on get passed, like, for example, the case of Loving versus Virginia, which is the court case that legalizes interracial marriage, because there were some areas that were actually banning it. And uh, the coverage should definitely not be telling you who you can and can't marry, uh, right? And that's going to, of course, later extend to uh, uh, homosexuals as well, appropriately. Letting you, of course, spend your life with and live with whoever you want. All right. And that's all we really need for the legal movement. Uh, but it's going to be a fairly successful one. Okay. So there's the legal. We also have a non-violent movement. And these are inspired, of course, by the tactics of Gandhi, who uh, won a somewhat peaceful separation from Great Britain and India. And uh, one big fan of this is the uh, minister uh, and Dr. Uh, Martin Luther King Jr. So he's going to be a big part of this, Martin Luther King Jr. We won't go too much into this because we get a lot of this stuff just in, you know, grade school history too. We all know who Martin Luther King Jr. is. And uh, some of the tactics he's, he's going to use for change are nonviolent tactics, which are incredibly powerful. If you use violent, you make yourself look like the aggressor or the bad guy. It's easy for people to not like you. But if you go at things peacefully and reasonably, and the other side responds violently, which they do in some points in the South, like in Selma um, in Montgomery, it's going to make your side look like the reasonable good one and then look like the evil backwards ones. And that's exactly what it does. Um, so this is going to be helped help by the fact that we do have TV coverage, by the way. Uh, but they're going to use tactics like boycotts. So if there's a business or state or whatever that's got some segregation policies or other discrimination, they just get blacks and sympathetic whites to not give them their business. And that, of course, forces the business to open up. Otherwise, they go out of business. Or... In some cases, they just go out of business, and hey, that worked out well. Now we don't have a, a racist, you know, restaurant. All right, so uh, boycotts. Another big one is sit-ins. Actually, before I talk about sit-ins, one of the biggest tactics borrowed from Gandhi was one called civil disobedience. That's where you take a law that you feel is unjust. Like, for example, Indians were forbidden from collecting salt on this one beach. I can't remember what it's called. Uh, but Gandhi felt like that was obviously a, a, an immoral and racist law. So he and thousands of others went down this beach and started collecting the salt. It's called the Salt March. Um, and then uh, since that was illegal, the British had to arrest them. But there were thousands of them. They can't arrest all of them. So it's sort of an idea of you take a law that's unjust. You have a lot of people disobey it nonviolently. And that really forces the government to look at that individual law as, wow, this is probably improper, immoral, racist, whatever. It's unenforceable. People are peacefully breaking it. We can't use violent force on a peaceful group of protesters. Um, so the civil disobedience movement becomes a, a, a major one as far as moving this nonviolent movement forward. So one example of civil disobedience is a sit-in that was largely started by a group of students. I can't remember the acronym stands for the student the SNCC is what it's called. Oh, Student National Something Committee. Yeah, Student National, I forget what it's called, but 
The SNCC is a bunch of stall college students, and uh, mostly blacks. They get some whites in there too, uh, but they're all about organizing these sit-ins and examples of civil disobedience. So what, I, what a sit-in is, when you go to a restaurant, say that has white-only seating, you would just have blacks and sympathetic whites sit in those seats and not move, right, non-violently. Uh, they would be harassed, of course. People would dump stuff on them, spit on them, punch them, burn cigarette butts on them. They'd be carried off and arrested, but they would just replace them. They'd have replacements ready to go and take those seats. Uh, peacefully disobeying those laws until they're changed. And of course, that got TV coverage as well and media coverage. And that's gonna show people that aren't in the South where this is going on. Because I mean, if I'm in California, I have largely no idea what's going on in the Deep South, right? But if it's on TV and the newspapers, then I very much do have an idea. And Congress knows, and the President knows. And so they can go about, you know, trying to change these things. Would you be able to use Rosa Parks as an example too? Yeah, that's a boycott. Now, she got arrested and removed and she was by herself, but that's where they boycotted the Montgomery boy, uh, busing system. Mm -hmm. So that's where they got a bunch of um, blacks, Jews, other minorities, and sympathetic whites to not use the buses for some amount of weeks. And then the, the busing system had to change their policy of you know, giving up seats to white people uh, because they were just losing so much business. So yeah, that's a specific example that I forgot to mention. The Montgomery bus boycott, and that was a success. And a lot of what MLK is going to use is success. They also use two uh, marches and rallies. All right, I'll just say speeches. So what they would do is to show their solidarity, they would have a whole bunch of people, thousands of people, go on these marches, peaceful marches. Some did turn into riots. It's really easy to happen. That's a psychological topic that we call de-individuation, where if you're in a group, it's really easy to lose your individual identity and sort of go with the mob. Uh, but the leaders did a decent job in most cases of keeping the population, especially the young people, from like rioting and looting. Uh, so they would go on these marches and give these rallies and speeches outside of Congress um, or in the major cities like Selma and Montgomery to sort of show, hey, we have thousands of people opposed to this terrible idea and we're here peacefully uh, to try to change that. So we had marches like the March on uh, Washington. That was like 200 something thousand people, like the biggest one by far ever. Uh, they did that one to try to pressure Congress to pass the Civil Rights Act, which they did. March on Washington, March on Selma, that was one that was um, quite violent uh, as far as white Southerners uh, persecuting them with fire hoses, dogs, you know, batons, things like that. That got TV coverage, that got newspaper coverage. Uh, the President, Congress, people throughout the Midwest, the East Coast, and the West Coast all got to see that, or the Northeast, I should say, uh, all got to see that, and that really turned opinions against the segregation uh, deeply rooted in the South. So, March on Selma, March on Washington. And these are going to be largely successful in convincing Congress to pass several acts, for example, like the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act, I know we haven't talked about uh, women yet, but the Equal Pay Act as well. I think this was 64, 65, and I think the Equal Pay Act is 63. These are all three landmark civil rights slash, you know, counterculture cases where Congress makes laws that protect the uh, rights, voting rights, and um, pay to prevent against discrimination against minorities and women. So basically no more poll taxes, no more literacy tests. Uh, you can't have segregation in any any shape or form. Uh, you have to pay women and men the same. You can't base the pay on you know their gender, right? That's been illegal since 1963. So <clears throat> all those things are examples of the civil rights movement and counterculture uh, successfully bringing about change peacefully. Now there were some non there were some violent tactics too. One of the examples is Malcolm X. Now, these are largely unsuccessful. Uh, he's definitely what you call radical. Um, he's one that thought that this was either too slow or ineffective. So he believed that blacks should unite to, I think the words they used, at least for the Black Panthers, not that Malcolm X led the Black Panthers, but when the Black Panthers started in Oakland, which is a movement inspired by Malcolm X, they thought it was, they worded it as for self-defense. But this is where the Black Power movement comes. 
Uh, this is a movement of, at least originally through Malcolm X, black separatists. They believed that uh, blacks were the superior race and they should fight for separation from white culture and white America. Like this is where they started intentionally changing their names to not be like, you know, you know, the Michaels and Johns and Kevins and things like that. Like they didn't want common names. So the Black Power Movement, they really started changing these names to come up with more what they thought of as Africanized names. Um, they started rejecting Christianity, like Malcolm X, for example, converted to Islam. Um, how do you, I can't remember how he phrased it, but he thought that should be the religion of, of, of blacks, essentially. Um, Muhammad Ali also is going to be a big person that really rejects American culture, adopts Islam itself, sort of identifies with the black power movement. Um, and that's a much more separatist uh, and militant movement. And then you have the Black Panthers too, in starting originating here in Oakland, which believe they had to take up violent actions to defend themselves, uh, and they condone that violence. Now this movement wasn't nearly as successful for bringing about change, but it did show a more radical and frustrated wing of the civil rights movement. Um, was Malcolm X the guy that I remember that somebody was like stressing that black should go back to Africa? That's been a that's been an idea that's been tossed around a lot uh, by whites and blacks. But then one of the points was was it Philip Randolph? One of them said, "What he's like? What do you mean go back to Africa? My family's been here for generations. I've never been there. I don't know what the culture's like. I don't know what the language is like. He's like, we're American." We just want to be treated equally like Americans, mm -hmm. which is a wonderful uh, way to think about it, yeah. right? Uh, and again, I can't remember who said that exact quote, but it's been an idea that's been tossed around by whites and blacks here. It's like, oh, let's just send them back to Africa. It's like, send who back? What do you mean? They got here 200 years ago, like their great, 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 great grandparents. Like, they're not from there. They're from America. They're, they're raised in American uh, culture. They're raised with an English language. American ideals, like they're Americans that should be treated the same as everybody else. So, but yeah, there was, I don't know if it was Malcolm X specifically, I just know he was a separatist in that initially, he does change his views later in life, mm -hmm. um, but initially he's a rather um, extreme separatist, right? And a lot of these groups are. The Black Panthers initially were. Um, the black power movement itself initially was. It's about rejecting and separating essentially from whites and white culture, uh, sometimes through violence. Okay. All right, and those are kind of the three prongs of this civil rights movement. Um, important to note, though, that just because they were nonviolent didn't mean that they weren't exposed to violence. I mean, MLK Jr. was assassinated by um, uh, a nice racist white southerner. Um, terrible guy. Uh, killed a terrible person, or killed a wonderful person, but uh, it's, a, it's a bad situation. So um, it doesn't mean that these guys were immune to violence. They had to experience a lot themselves. Like I said, uh, MLK Jr. killed by one. Um, they had to experience a lot of violence in Selma, in that March 2 Selma. Uh, so yeah, this did not mean you didn't get a violent response, but their nonviolent approach was far more reasonable and sympathetic uh, to people that got to see what was happening. Right, and it worked. Largely worked. Okay, so that's the civil rights movement. And one thing, no, I don't need to go there yet. I'll go there after when we get the, the study. So we're still kind of in the 60s mode here. Oh, one thing I forgot to mention, my bad. Uh, before all this, in the 50s still, um, there was a, a, a big movement against segregation in the military. One of the leaders of this was uh, Philip A. Randolph a very reasonable <coughs> black um, blacks rights activist, civil rights activist. Uh, and he, had, he argued for the desegregation of the military. And uh, Harry Truman, at the president at the time, agreed, and he's going to desegregate the military uh, pretty early on, like before Harry Truman was even out of office later, under Eisenhower. All right. So that's the civil rights movement. Moving on to second wave feminism. So first wave, obviously, is uh, right to vote. Second wave feminism can probably be summed up as the fight, successful fight, for equality of opportunity. That means 
that women should, and it's actually better for society in this way, of course, that women who want to should be able to pursue whatever course regarding career and child rearing or lifestyle they want. So if they want to be single and promiscuous, they should be able to, right? There shouldn't be a double standard there. If they want to uh, pursue a career instead of uh, being a wife and mother, they should be able to. Or if they want to do both and just delay the wife and motherhood to later, they should have that option open. If they want to run for political office, they should be able to do that. If they want to manage a company, they should be able to do that, right? That's what the second wave feminism was more, that was what the focus of the of second wave movement was, right? And everyone now, almost almost everyone now is second wave feminism, feminist. If they aren't, they should be. Um, because again, even if, even if you think, if, even if you're bigoted and you think women in general are worse at something or, or whatever, like you should be able to understand that there's definitely in that group some women that are great at, you know, whatever. And you as a person should want for society those motivated good people to be involved in doing things in whatever field, you know, that might be. All right. <clears throat> so that's why second wave feminism is so wonderful. It's, if you want to pursue a career to late childbirth, go right ahead. Right. If you also, on the other hand, if you want to stay home uh, and be a housewife or have kids and be a part-time worker or whatever it is, you should have the right to do that as well. Uh, and you shouldn't be harassed for either of those choices or anything in between. All right, so some leading figures here. Betty Friedan read a book called The um, Feminine Mystique. Uh, in Europe, we had a writer named, she's, she's more of a, She's kind of leaning towards what is now third wave feminism, which isn't, it's more of a postmodern dismantle the white patriarchy. Like I think she had a quote where she said, we can't give women the choice to stay home and have kids because two women will choose that. Um, that I'm paraphrasing, but she had, she had some more radical views on feminism, but she, she at least got the ball rolling in the right direction with allowing equality of opportunity for everybody. Um, and we had, of course, Simone de Beauvoir. And she had some excellent points, too. Uh, it's called The Second Sex was her book. So both these ladies made uh, excellent publications that are critical of society at the time. Uh, Biddy Friedan, of course, made the point that most women are not happy just staying at home being a housewife. And we'll talk about why that's, there's such a big shift in the 1950s and 60s. And then Simone de Beauvoir talked about how historically women have been treated as a second-class citizen, not allowed certain rights and opportunities, uh, despite you know plenty of ability. And both of them had excellent points at the time to make uh, and were absolutely right that women were limited and shouldn't be limited. So why all of a sudden in the 1950s and 60s we have this? So first of all, you have that whole postmodern, you know, ideal that, you know, the Western patriarchal is oppressive, uh, system is oppressive and needs to be dismantled, etc. And again, at the time, there was definitely some evidence of that that needed to definitely be fixed. Uh, but also, we have some cultural changes. One of the biggest ones I already mentioned is appliances. That is going to drastically reduce the amount of time it took to do a housework. So if you were a housewife, for example, in the early, early 20th century, the 19th century, like you were spending most of your day actually cooking, preparing food, cleaning clothes in the house, etc. You didn't have appliances to do that. It took you most of the day to do that. You probably had a lot of kids, too, because there was no birth control, or at least not reliable birth control. So these two factors are going to drastically free up it, it, it's, it's like a technological revolution like that turned into a social revolution because women now all of a sudden have way more time, right? So now they can do their household chores that it used to take the whole day uh, in just a, two, three hours, right? So it's like, all right, you're done before noon. It's like, what else am I going to do? So a lot of women, of course, choose to pursue uh, jobs, careers, uh, involve themselves more with their with their family and their kids, like you know, being more involved with school or PTA or whatever it is. Um, so you had a bunch of uh, idle women, of course, which are going to be just bored and want to have these opportunities to pursue jobs and careers, education, uh, you know, work at the schools with their kids, etc. So appliances free up a lot of time, right? Uh, and also the birth control, you can delay childbirth. So not only are you not, you know, having more kids than you want to have, but now you're not, you know, accidentally having a kid at 19, you know, and, and killing any chance you have of getting, pursuing a career or an education. So now you can uh, realistically and reliably delay childbirth. 
right? So again, let's say I'm a woman who does want a family, but first I want an education or a job or whatever, uh, and I want to wait till I'm like maybe 28 to have a kid or something. Um, now I actually can. Whereas before, there's a good chance that I would accidentally get pregnant probably several times before I'm 28 and would ruin my chance of going to finishing college, you know, establishing a career, et cetera. So the birth control, uh, the pill, and other contraceptions and appliances really give females a lot more control of their sexual life, first of all, because now they can, if they want to be, they can be more promiscuous. Um, but also, it allows them to choose when they, want, when they have kids and they're not just stuck at home doing chores the whole time because now those chores can be done much more quickly. So they can be shared with the husband uh, or done just by the wife and then she still has the rest of the day to pursue whatever else. So uh, it's a bunch of women who of course want more opportunities because they have more time and freedom to do that. So second wave feminism very appropriately coincides with that. In fact, you would, the two are linked. That's the reason why this happens when it happens. Uh, so yes, that's exactly what they're fighting for. And of course, they get it largely for the most part because who's gonna oppose that? There are some conservatives who do oppose that as sort of a, uh, you know, what, how do I say this? Challenging traditional lifestyle sort of approach they take to it, but for the most part, it's a pretty successful movement. Uh, like, it's, like I mentioned, you have the Equal Pay Act. Um, you have, of course, the whole Title IX, uh, giving women uh, equal access to things, uh, equal pay, and this is gonna open things up. You're gonna see women, start seeing women, you're going to start seeing women in politics. Like by the 1980s, we have several prominent uh, figures in politics, including um, Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher over there in um, uh, the UK. So here we're gonna see a, a large influx of women into the workforce and into politics. Rightfully so, and wonderful for everyone because now those motivated, capable women that want to can go and do and pursue that, and that's gonna make the world a better place for all of us. Not just women though, you also have the LGBTQ movement uh, trying to fight persecution. Like I told you, they're viewed as a mental a mental illness up until 1971, like officially classified by the APA is that. Um, a lot of Christian fundamentalists, not even Christian fundamentalists, just a lot of WASP society and the greater world. I mean, if you guys leave the West, they are not friendly in the rest of the world to homosexuals. Uh, whether you're going to Latin America or, uh, let's see, the Islamic world, much of Asia, like they are not, not, not friendly to homosexuals. We were no exception to that. So it's gonna take a long time for the uh, gay rights movement to you know, win the equal treatment and rights uh, that heterosexuals have, like the right to marriage and adoption and things like that, not being persecuted or punished. Like for example, during World War II, it was illegal to be homosexual in the UK. Like, you'd be arrested for that, right? Even engaging in those sorts of things. So having the freedom to pursue their own you know, biological interests and drives like that uh, which is something that should be an American fundamental, is going to mo increasingly be um, applied. It takes longer though. Like these two movements occur within a decade or two. The LGBTQ one is really just wrapped up mostly, generally speaking, the last like 10 or 20 years. So um, like I remember in the 90s, there was still this, the policy towards homosexuals was like a don't ask, don't tell sort of thing. Uh, whereas now it's, you can be much more open about it. Like people are still likely gonna judge you, but at least legally you're protected. <clears throat> oh, there's still some debate about that with the whole Baker incident, the guy that denied, he denied baking a cake for a gay marriage because it was against his religious views. So yeah, you could argue that there's definitely still some issues, but uh, that LGBTQ movement, movement really began there. We also have a big movement for environmentalism. People felt like we were oppressing the environment. So you have organizations like Greenpeace start, which advocate for the environment. They try to enlighten people as to how we are harming and destroying the uh, environment. And then of course, on the more radical activist side, you have people actively trying to stop it, like sabotaging corporations and their you know, building of oil lines or new buildings and you got like PETA and stuff like the throwing fake blood on, you know, furs and stuff like that. Like, so it, you, 
it's not just, hey, let's inform the whole world, this Greenpeace movement. You've also got a very radical wing that it's, it's actually called ecotage, where you're trying to sabotage the corporate or anti-animal rights or anti-environment uh, views of people that either don't care or are just against uh, uh, the Greenpeace movement, so ecotage. But on a, on a more formal level, we have in 1970, started by Nixon, actually a Republican, the Environmental Protection Agency, which started looking into you know, pollution, regulating uh, uh, pollution, recycling, things like that, looking to preserve the environment. Because even if you're not somebody that cares about the environment, you should definitely care about your own use of the environment. Like if the air is too toxic to breathe and the water too toxic to use, like even if you didn't care about the animals and plants, like you should at least care about yourself uh, or your kids and grandkids. So I would say over time, especially environmental has become a more bipartisan approach. Cause I mean, if you just, just take a cursory glance at China or India right now and look at the crap they have to deal with, like the permanent smog that's over several of the Chinese cities, um, the terrible pollution um, of the rivers and air and streets of many of India's biggest cities, like nobody likes that. So <clears throat> environmentalism is gonna be a much bigger and more bipartisan movement. Now again, people still differ on how it should be approached. Like Republicans tend to take a more laissez-faire approach and Democrats tend to take a more interventionist approach to it. But um, environmentalism is going to really become a big issue here uh, in the United States and in the West in the 1960s and 70s. What is the name again? The environmental... environmental Protection Agency. That was actually started by Richard Nixon, um, a Republican in the 1970s. That's why it's always funny when like places like Fox News and stuff try to claim that Republicans started the environmentalists. But it's like, yeah, technically, but Nixon did it more as like a trying to win public support. He wasn't really genuinely, you know, doing it uh, to better the environment. <clears throat> all right, so all this together is known as what's called kind of the, uh, what's called the new left. And again, uh, you've got some very reasonable people on here that are opposed to the systematic oppression that was in place against uh, gays and lesbians, women, uh, blacks, other minorities, etc. But, um, it's gonna start deviating away from the traditional left. The traditional left was like a Marxist working class oriented uh, party. This is more so just opposed to whatever they see as oppression. Some people even call it neo-Marxism, uh, which is really derived from postmodern thought that again, white patriarchal arbitrary power is what dictates the world and we should fight, rise up against it. So this new left again is opposed to uh, racism, sexism, homophobia, et cetera, the list goes on. Uh, it's expanded now into intersectionality, which believes all forces should come together to, despite other differences, work against white male patriarchy. But uh, that is the new left, and the new left really starts here in the 1960s and 1970s. And goddamn, they were right at the time that there was a lot of stuff that did need to be replaced that was present in our, what should have been, <clears throat> very libertarian society. Is this when, like, uh, there was, like, that whole liberal and conservative switch? Like, the people who believed in, like, um, the idea that the government should stay out of things and stuff like that, that's when the name switched? No, uh, the left's always been more, since FDR, they've been more interventionist. That's what we talked about last time. Uh -huh. um, FDR is the one that really made the Democrats and the left, like, got more government intervention and the right became less government intervention. Uh, that still applies, but the new left isn't focused on like unions and workers, they're focused on any group they see as oppressed or behind. <clears throat> and that can be good, right? But, and it was good in, in issuing all this change, but you know, nowadays, they're, at least in the West, they're left without direction. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're forming up to come up with some very odd policies and opinions, <clears throat> much of which isn't uh, empirically based or factually based. Oh, I almost forgot, by the way, speaking of workers, there was a worker movement that was also part of this new left sort of racial movement. We have a lot of immigrants or coming in from the south, uh, across the southern border through Mexico into the Sun Belt regions because the population's increasing, like we already mentioned. 
But also there's a boom in agriculture in Southern California and in the Valley here and in the Midwest. Uh, so we have a lot of migrant workers, I'll actually include this down here, <clears throat> migrant workers who are going to uh, unionize. So most of these are Mexican migrant workers or at least Latin American. Um, they're going to unite in the 60s uh, behind a guy named Cesar Chavez and they're going to unionize for better agricultural uh, pay and treatment, because that's something they had to deal with. Some discrimination, some, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Not, definitely not crony capitalism, but some, some intentional underpayment, under treatment, uh, and they're gonna unionize to try to make for better pay, better conditions for those migrant workers. Because we do have a bunch of migrant workers coming up from Latin America, mostly from Mexico, but from Latin America, uh, to work uh, in these areas. And the reason why we're going to get so many more is because we, in 1965, are going to pass a thing called the Immigration Act. And this is going to eliminate the quotas set by the 1924 Immigration Act, which, again, basically made it you, so you couldn't migrate here. Only a few people that weren't from... Uh, Northern and Western Europe could migrate here. Got rid of the quotas. So no more national quotas. As a result, we see a massive increase in Asian and uh, Hispanic, mostly Mexican, but Hispanic uh, migration. And remember, don't confuse the two. Hispanic means you're Latin American. You're a mix of Spanish and Portuguese uh, and, and uh, Native American, so mestizo. Mexican is a nationality, it means you're a citizen of Mexico. Uh, but all people, for the most part, Mexico and South, are Hispanic, meaning they have ancestry rooted in either Spain or Portugal, plus the Native Americans that were in their region, whether Incan or Mayan or Aztec or whatever. So, huge increase in Asian Hispanic migration, and we just get a massive flux of, of immigrants. And a lot of them, again, are going to be these migrant workers that come into work uh, for agricultural labor. Uh, so that can be and is going to be helpful, but there are some unforeseen consequences of this flood of migrants. So one problem that's going to occur is a thing called stagflation, but I got to talk about one more thing before we do that. So before I talk about stagflation, let's talk about as a part of this new left, they're still going to have some class-based policies. And one of the primary class-based policies we're going to see here is the Great Society proposed by Lyndon B. Johnson, who's a Democrat, in the 1960s. And the Great Society is going to be an attempt to provide aid for disadvantaged groups, mostly poor people. So it's basically trying to eliminate poverty. Now, it really doesn't help out at all, but it's an attempt to. right? So some things they try to do. They try to enhance social security. They make food stamps more accessible and welfare more accessible. So welfare, food stamps accessible. Uh, expanding social security. They also implement things like uh, Medicare and Medicaid, which is government aid, especially when you're older, uh, to pay for pharmaceuticals and other health issues. Because again, as you get older, past your 50s and 60s, you require a lot more attention from doctors and physicians and surgeries and scans and pharmaceuticals and things like that. So this is basically money to help with that. So these are a lot of programs that are designed to try to help people out that are on the lower rungs of society regarding um, finances anyway, or, or income, I should say. So wonderful for some of the people that needed it, right? You've got you know, especially single moms that need this help, but some people argue that it's actually promoted that lifestyle, meaning like, for example, there's some evidence to suggest that, look, it's not 100%, but it, there is some evidence to suggest that, um, in fact, J.K. Rowling's talked about this too, even in the UK, how you get kind of stuck, like if you're a single mom, and let's say your husband left or whatever, and you're left with a low income or no income and children, the state will pay you until you find a job, but it's really hard to get a job that pays more than the money you were already getting. So you get kind of stuck in this limbo where it's like, well, I could work for slightly more money, but then I'm missing all this time with my kids and all this stuff, or I get a job and I make less money, 
than I was making for free through these programs. So it actually like almost encourages you to stay unemployed. I'm not saying that's an excuse or anything like that, but there is some evidence to suggest that it does put people in an awkward spot that it's hard to get out of. Uh, and again, a very, J.K. Rowling is a very left-minded person, is one who spoke about this herself because uh, she experienced it, uh, albeit in the UK, but the programs were set up somewhat similarly uh, here and there. So these are wonderful because they do help those people out who do need it, and there's definitely plenty of people that genuinely need that help to get out of a tough spot in life, uh, but it is going to be expensive. So it is, uh, it's gonna up taxes and up government spending, which means our deficit increase is going to increase. So there are plenty of critics. Critics, and um, not long after this approach to try to help out the poor, we also have a uh, policy known as affirmative action, which some people felt needed to happen. This is again gonna establish uh, quotas for businesses and colleges based on race. So the idea here is, hey, blacks have had a rough time. Some people are unwilling to hire blacks. We should require certain universities or businesses to uh, have, you know, X amount or X percentage of various ethnicities there. Like, they shouldn't be able to say no because of the person's skin color or gender or whatever, which is an excellent idea. Um, however, critics of these programs, uh, mostly conservatives but and some moderates, and any libertarian, uh, they criticize it because they argue that any good university or business is not going to exclude people based on race or gender. And if they are, then, well, go ahead and let them. They're going to fail because they're not going to have the best people. And that such policies do potentially eliminate the most qualified person just because of their skin color or their genitalia. And they say there's wrong. So there's two very different arguments there. And, you know, you can side however you want on that. Those are the two arguments, but these are some programs being implemented by the government that many moderates, libertarians, and conservatives are going to oppose. So it's part of the new left's regime to help out the poor and minorities and whatnot, but you're going to get some pushback from a lot of more libertarian-minded people, like the moderates and the conservatives. Uh, so that's the 60s and 70s. Those are government attempts to try to remedy these historical uh, inequalities. And that's going to result in, in the late 70s and 80s, a big resurgence for conservatives. As those moderates who were rightfully siding with the um, uh, you know, leftist libertarians, they're now seeing this as more authoritarian. Like This is like, hey, open up choice for everybody. Most people agree with that. Moderates side with that. However, when you start plucking in and requiring things, that's when libertarians, uh, libertarian or more oriented moderates start backing off and start siding with the conservatives on uh, keeping things open to choice. So in the 60s, that was the momentum for the left. Going to the 80s, the momentum is going to go more towards the right because those moderates are going to shift. Those libertarian moderates who supported freedom and equal opportunity now are like, whoa, 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 now you're starting to require things and things are costing us money. So they start shifting their opinion back. So you, can see, you, you see it a lot in, U, in U.S. history where... You know, whatever side becomes more authoritarian, the moderates start, you know, piling over the other way. And then that side gets authoritarian, and then they start piling back the other way. It just keeps going back and forth. So the, what you're seeing right now, for example, is a lot of people have believed that the new left has driven things too authoritarian uh, to the left. And now the moderates are starting to dogpile back over to the right um, with conservatives and libertarians. Anyways, so those are the policies of the 60s and 70s. And got immigration, great society, got the protest, Kentucky State, draft, Sunbelt. All right, now we just got to talk about the silent majority, Arabs, scandals. Guys, there's still a lot of stuff to talk about. All right. Mm. Um, all of this put together is going to draw a negative response, like I mentioned, from what uh, President Nixon calls the silent majority, the moderates and conservatives who felt like maybe some of these changes occurred too quickly, or maybe they were superimposing themselves on people's individual liberty, whether it's a business or whatever. So uh, we're going to see a conservative resurgence going into the um, resurgence, going into the 70s, late 70s anyway, and certainly by the 80s. 
Uh, Nixon called this group the silent majority. Those who were opposed to uh, some of these rapid social changes or authoritarian sort of policies. So it's a mix, right? Like I mentioned, you're going to have your moderates that are going to start t tilting the other way when they start having you know, the government impose upon them. But also you have some very right-wing conservatives opposed to many of the, um, uh, what they see as immoral immorality of the 1960s. Like, they don't like being more Bible, Christian-oriented. They're not fans of um, the LBGTQ movement. They're not fans of the sexual revolution. They're not for fans of the drug movements and the hedonism that goes with that. So, again, what Nixon calls a silent majority are those conservatives and moderates that are opposed to this rapid social change, whether they have a um, more fundamental opposition to the morals or they have a more libertarian opposition to the uh, more authoritarian government policies that are being placed, uh, you're going to start seeing a shift, uh, which gets Nixon elected and definitely gets Reagan and George Bush, H.W. Bush, uh, elected and keeps them in office throughout the 1980s. So the silent majority. Uh, again, a lot of this is based in that Sun Belt region, the suburbs, like we were talking about. Uh, but also, they're very much opposed to a movement, not a movement, but a development known as stagflation, which is a weird situation the U.S. economy's never been in, where we have increase in prices and inflation, which is normally a good thing, but wages stay flat, they stay the same. And the reason why is a completely unanticipated consequence of um, the 1960s. So here's what happens. <clears throat> the economy's growing in the 50s and 60s, and the 70s, boom, wages stop flat. Because we have, we have overemployment, we have unemployment. The reason why, and again, don't misinterpret this as me saying it's a bad thing. It's just an unintended consequence that took us time to adjust to. So in the 60s and 70s, you had a flood of new workers coming in the form of immigrants, right? Because of this Immigration Act, where I don't know where I put it. Wherever I put it. There. Immigration Act 1965. Lots of those coming in for work. Women joining the workforce as well. And minorities. So again, don't misconstrue what I'm saying here. Don't think I'm saying this is a bad thing. This is just an unintended consequence that took us a while to adjust to. So what happens here is, even though the economy is growing and people are selling more, they don't need to hire, or sorry, they have too many people. There's not enough work to go around because there's so many new immigrants, women and minorities join the workforce, which is what they should be able to do. But temporarily, for a decade or so, there's not enough jobs for them. So the reason why wages don't go up is, if you want to fight for wages and strike, that's, that's great if there's a labor shortage. If there's just a bunch of people, though, that are willing to take your spot, you're not going to be able to negotiate your wages. So, as a result, wages stay the same. You ask for a raise, I say no, you leave, no problem, I replace you. You strike for wage increases, no problem, I replace you. Right. So since we have this surplus of labor, wages stay flat for a while. We also have a big price hike because of the Arab oil embargo. In 1973, gas prices shoot way up, which contributes to this price increase. Uh, that's because um, OPEC, all the Arab nations basically, it's technically oil producing and exporting, no, oil and petroleum exporting countries. I might have mis mischaracterized that acronym, but um, which are mostly Arab nations, Muslim, Muslim states. They agreed to pass an embargo in the United States because the United States had funded uh, Israel in the Yom Kippur War in 1973. Um, so as a result, the U.S. lost its tie to most of its oil. That caused a shortage of oil, which shot the gas prices way up, caused gas to be very expensive, uh, very inaccessible. We had like lines of cars going for blocks. Um, I remember my dad talking about how he used to have to back the car up to the, like the, the fence in the wall so people wouldn't siphon it um, or in the garage. So it, it, got, it got pretty nuts. But that drastically increased uh, the price of, of fuel which increased the price for everything. Because if I'm transporting goods, which everyone has to do to stock the store, it now costs more to transport the goods. So all prices rise, the economy continues to grow, but wages stay flat because there are so many workers that are ready to fill the spots of other people. So you have this awkward 1970s period where you have a lot of um, um, discontent people who have a little money.
Oh, I forgot to mention. Another reason why we have a resurgence of conservatives and moderates, um, that especially the conservatives who are opposed to the quote-unquote immorality of the 1960s and the hippie movement and all that and the sexual revolution is you have a lot of conservatives that are very much opposed to abortion, which is going to be legalized with the Roe versus Wade case in 1971. So, of course, um, most feminists at the time, well, I can't even say that because women are split almost 50-50 on abortion, even today. Uh, but, yeah, it's pretty crazy. Um, but at the time, most Christians, for sure, and a lot of them still do, opposed abortion as um, unethical uh, because they, they saw it as, proponents saw it as a protection of women's privacy and rights to their body, whereas opponents see it as, saw and see it as um, killing a child, right? So that drew a lot of animosity and opposition from this uh, silent conservative-based majority, right? Which is going to lead to a lot of Reagan and Reaganomics and, and, and Reagan foreign policy in the 1980s. This is for abortion, correct? Yes, okay. that is for abortion. Oh, okay. Abortion legalized. I think the techni technicality was doctor-patient confidentiality, so you couldn't inquire as to what was being done to them. So it's was, it was like a privacy issue, which made it legal in turn. Mm -hmm. Okay, just making sure I covered everything. Civil rights, postmodern, new left, feminism, oil embargo, conservative resurgence, silent majority, stagflation, great society. There's so many topics. All right, the last one before we take our break and start period nine is the scandals in opposition to executive power. <clears throat> All right, scandals, yeah, Watergate. This is pretty, should be quickish. So President Nixon, who was elected, elected in, I think, 68, I think that was the year, <clears throat> um, he barely won. He credited the silent majority for the win, but he barely won. So he really wanted to know what the Democrats were doing going into the election of 72. So what he does is he hires um, basically spies and uses government resources to uh, illegally wiretap the DNC, the Democratic National Convention, the, the party members that were running the party. The party members that were running the campaigns, there we go, to see their tactics and candidates and all that stuff. They get caught, though. The DNC is at the Watergate Hotel. These individuals get caught uh, wiretapping and spying. And pretty quickly, with journalists and others following the money trail and uh, these various stories, they start linking it back to Nixon, uh, the president. So they link to Nixon. They don't have, they don't have you know, convicted or anything, but they link it back to him, and uh, it's looking bad for Nixon. And he, perhaps unfortunately for him, always records his conversations uh, in the Oval Office uh, and on the phone. So when they request officially his tapes, he refuses to give them first. He claims executive privilege. He claims that uh, the president has the right to withhold nation information for uh, national security. National security. So he's like, no, I don't have to give the tapes, despite your court and congressional order, because I have the right of executive privilege, which means I talk about a lot of national security secrets, and that information cannot get out. Right? So he had a good little legal ploy. That's what they called him, Tricky Dick, anyway. That was his nickname, because he was very slithery <clears throat> with things like this. So he claimed executive privilege. Nonetheless, they're going to override that. And so he doesn't have to get the tapes back, but first he erases several tapes, and he very clearly tampers with the evidence. So erases tapes. This is a big scandal, by the way. Like, all of this is publicized. As soon as journalists start tying this back to Nixon and following the money trail and having people, of course, name him, and then, uh, and then he, he refuses to get the tapes back, and when he does, he erases some of them. It's very clear uh, that he has meddled uh, with, um, at the very least, justice. And he is likely to become impeached, which just means tried, and probably convicted and removed. So before he can do that, he resigns, his vice president takes over uh, for Gerald Ford, and then Gerald Ford uses the presidential, presidential power of pardon and pardon some of these crimes so he can't be tried, and uh, the nation is quite upset that he's basically got away scot-free, knowing essentially he was guilty at least of this and possibly other things.
So this was a huge uh, damper, damper on U.S. prestige, especially the, the position of the president. And people were very upset with this abuse of executive power. Another, another aspect of power they were upset with, again with Nixon, was his uh, illegal bombing of Cambodia, a neutral country, during the Vietnam War. And again, they were going for that Ho Chi Minh Trail supply line to the south. Um, and lastly, people were somewhat upset with just the president's power during the Vietnam War. We have the Tonkin Gulf Resolution, which you already mentioned. <clears throat> Wait, wasn't there the um, Pentagon Papers as well? Yep, we have that too, but I'm, we're just going to focus on these three to keep it simple. Uh, but the uh, Tonkin Gulf Resolution uh, gave uh, the president a bunch of war powers that were kind of unclear and maybe a little too authoritative. Uh, and that's going to be something that people are really going to uh, question, especially with the Watergate scandal. Uh, and that's really going to tarnish, like I said, the office and prestige of the presidency, cause people to question it, uh, and all of that. So the last topic I, I, I kind of brushed over probably too quickly was the Cuban Missile Crisis. Just to reiterate what that is, because that's kind of a presidential thing, it's more of a Cold War thing. Oh, you know what I forgot? I forgot to talk about the military-industrial complex, too. All right, so that's two, two topics, actually. So, going back to the Cold War, two topics I forgot to elaborate on. Number one is there's a topic known as the military industrial complex and that is the idea that starting from World War II since we are so I write it up here is the idea that we're so caught up in Keynesian spending to provide um, demand but provide jobs which can increase demand in the economy and keep economic growth. They think we're over, overly involved in military spending. So whether it's production of arms or armor or ships or keeping a large army or being involved in our wars to use these things or selling those weapons to uh, the rest of the world like in Latin America and the Middle East. Uh, this is a term coined by Eisenhower, who was actually a general, a very pro-American general. And even he warned against this American addiction to um, spending on defense, meaning we're shoveling a bunch of money into um, military production uh, to protect our economy, and that's something we should consider stepping back on because it's accruing a lot of debt, and we're also, we have just too many weapons, and we're just selling them off to the rest of the world and potentially um, inciting more violence than we, than we need to be. All right, so that's the military-industrial complex. And lastly, the... Uh, Cuban Missile Crisis, and I believe it was 1959, with the Cuban Revolution, the Cubans under Fidel Castro and Che Guevara and Raul Castro and the communists kicked out the American-backed puppet leader, Batista, who again was pro-American, he was connected with organized crime, gave American companies you know, plenty of benefits. We support him because he was pro-American. Uh, he was abusing his power as the leader of Cuba, and so Fidel Castro and others rose up and kicked him out. And we hated that in the United States because that was a communist nation 90 miles away from us now, right? Literally in our back door, right next to us. And the Soviets saw that as an opportunity to put nuclear missiles right next to us. Because we had missiles next to them in Germany and Turkey, and they had nothing near us as far as nuclear weapons went. So they start building these missile sites in Cuba. Our CIA and satellites spot them. And uh, that is the point where Kennedy directly threatens the uh, Soviets that if you send these missiles over, we will stop you by force. And that, of course, is almost certainly going to start uh, World War III. So it's like a week-long, like it's this nine-day period where this tense standoff between the Soviets and the U.S. And it was like... Are they going to start a war over this? Uh, but the Soviets didn't have turning around, not installing the missiles, and we have we avoided World War III. So that was the Cuban Missile Crisis. You guys got it? That's period eight. Oh, it's just period nine now. Oh.